Okay, uh, good morning everyone. I think I'll um, make a start. We're obviously running late on the day and I already had too much to show you anyway, so now I've got way too much to show you. Uh, what I'm here to talk about is uh, building fabric retrofit. I'm just going to get these guys to quieten down if I can. Can I ask you to quieten down now? Yeah, I'm about to start. If okay. you do, if you Sorry about that. Right, I'm going to talk about building fabric retrofit. This is uh, basically a course that Peter Rickaby and I do here at um, CORE, and we take all day over it. Uh, so I've been asked to kind of squish that down into originally an hour and a quarter, now in about three quarters of an hour. So um, it's going to be a fast ride, and I'm going to skip over loads of things. If you have questions, you know, Grab me at the end, or, or you know, if you stick your hand up, because it's really important, I will try and dip in and dip out. Um, but just take that on board that it's not going to be too detailed, and it'll be a broad overview. So to start off with, we talk about principles, strategies, and the standards that are involved in the fabric elements of, of building retrofit. What we're trying to do in terms of objectives, of course, is primarily to impede the passage of heat through the fabric. We want to stop heat escaping from our buildings uh, in both directions. It's worth remembering that insulation works to keep heat out as well as heat in. So what we're doing by retrofitting is improving the capability of our fabric to uh, retain that heat. <coughs> we want to keep the cold air that's on the outside outside the building where it's meant to be. So air tightness becomes an important element within our retrofit work. And we need to deal with the warm air on the inside of our buildings as well. So uh, thinking how our fabric integrates with our ventilation strategy is key as well. Uh, as is in it controlling the movement of moisture through our fabric itself and minimising the risk of that moisture condensing on colder surfaces within the fabric buildup. What we're trying to do is envelop the building evenly in insulation around the entire three-dimensional surface of the space that we're trying to heat to get even internal surface temperatures. We need to do the same application to air tightness standards. It's like squeezing a balloon. If you only do it, if you squeeze it partially in one area, then it'll bulge out of the other area. So you really need to envelop your, your uh, building, your dwelling entirely in terms of both insulation and air tightness. And retrofit is all about the, the techniques and understandings that enable you to do that in practice. More often than not, we would be recommending that you use vapour permeable construction to promote the safe passage of moisture through your fabric. But if, you aren't, if you're using products that aren't vapour permeable because of they perhaps have a higher performance, then you need to also think about how you're going to deal with the moisture build up in that room. That in itself is, is, a, is subject to another session entirely. Uh, I think you can probably pick up a, a short version of that this afternoon as well. One other consideration in retrofit is whether or not you can retain the thermal capacity of that existing envelope. We see around us the thermal mass embodied in these big kilns um, that's helping to modulate peak temperatures within that space and retrofitting on the outside of that can help to utilise the benefits of that, uh, that, that circumstances. Retrofit can also protect against solar gains. In the session that we do, there's a whole section on overheating, and I'll, I'll touch on that a bit this morning. Um, most importantly, we need to do this not just for now. It needs to be robust enough that it, the the performance that we get in year one is going to be as good as the performance we get in year 20 or 30. So it's about doing it in a robust way. And I've already touched on the fact that this needs to be part of a holistic whole house retrofit, integrating with the ventilation strategy and integrating with your heating strategy. I'm not really going to touch on the latter two today. Uh, I'm just going to do the bits 
that I know most about as an architect involved in retrofit. And I've been involved in retrofit I don't know, probably six or seven years, I would say now, and a lot of what I do at the moment is quite large-scale retrofit buildings. So we talk about the fabric-first approach, um, which is item one on this kind of list of things to tackle, really. So fabric-first is about improving the building fabric to minimise the heat losses. And we do that because insulating the building is the most cost-effective long-term measure that we can do to reduce carbon emissions. Having done all that and done it effectively, then the level of energy demand that you need to supply through the building services is greatly reduced and the burden on those services is also greatly reduced because services tend to have shorter uh, active lives compared to, say, insulation, which is fairly benign and sits there doing its job quite well over 60, 70, 80 years. <coughs> Finally, we would then advise you to think about how you might sensibly integrate renewable energy into your retrofit strategy. Um, but I'm just going to talk about fabric first stuff today. And one of the things that often gets missed when we talk about fabric first is the interfaces. This is where things tend to go wrong. It's, all, it's fairly straightforward to understand how insulation pinned to the outside of a wall is going to help you improve the the thermal performance of your property. But it's understanding how that needs to integrate with the loft insulation or the floor insulation or with the air barrier. Those are the tricky bits uh, that, that skills, um, where we need to develop our skills and our understanding. I, I don't claim to be an expert, although I'm delivering a master class. I, I like to think of it more as I, I've probably got it wrong more times than the rest of you and therefore had the benefit of of understanding what I would do differently next time. <coughs> and then finally, um, of course, we need to think about the people who are going to use this building and they need to understand uh, how all of this works as a system, um, how they can control it and get the best performance out of it. We touched a lot on standards in the kind of uh, plenary sessions this morning. Um, I would argue building regs part L1B here sets minimum standards and I like to think of building regs as the kind of worst performing building fabric that you can legally get away with. Don't think of it as a stretching target to get to. Get to. Think of it as something that people will try to get away with uh, um, and as the as a lowest common standard. There's no kind of definitive guidance on what makes good practice standard. This is kind of a set of figures based on a view values and air tightness that we would argue are a good, sensible practice um, for a majority of retrofit properties. A lot of what the work I'm doing at the moment is to uh, the ENFIT standard, which is the retrofit equivalent of passive house and therefore a very stretching target for very good reasons. It works holistically as a package to deliver exceptional comfort and exceptional savings in energy. The, one of the projects I'm working on at the moment, for example, is uh, predicted to reduce space heating demand from 220 kilowatt hours per meter squared to less than 20. That's a 90% improvement. So that works fantastically where it's appropriate. It's not going to be appropriate everywhere, but I would argue that on certain buildings, if we can achieve benefit, that allows us to be more relaxed about more sensitive buildings. In the course that we deliver here, we talk a lot in a detail about all the various types of insulation that you can use to retrofit buildings. Broadly, they can be uh, grouped together into those four headings. Natural insulations mostly come from crops or, or wool areas and they will tend to be lower performing in themselves and therefore you need more of them uh, to achieve the same performance. The fossil fuel based products, mostly derived from petrochemical sources, will give you the best performance for, th for the thickness. Uh, and they may have other advantages or constraints that we'll come on to as well. Mineral products such as the stone walls or glass walls tend to be spun or exfoliated 
Rock wall, for example, is made much like candy floss by heating up stone, spinning it in a kiln. It can be quite energy intensive, so your embodied energy, perhaps not as low as, say, a natural material, but you might be getting a better performance out of that, so it's a trade-off between all of those products. And the fourth group we've kind of loosely headed here is as radiant uh, products. These will be the ones that are metal-based and work on the basis of uh, impeding radiant heat transfer. Typically, they might need to be used in conjunction with a conventional installation to give you the performance that you need overall, but they will bring the benefits of uh, the radi dealing with the radiant heat transfer if installed properly. What are we looking for in our insulation products? Well, we're looking for performance in terms of thermal conductivity. So how, how, much, how thick do I need to achieve the same level of thermal improvement? Is it vapour permeable? Does it allow moisture to transfer through that product or does it, is it impermeable to moisture? What's the embodied trade-off? Most insulations are going to pay back their embodied carbon fairly quickly in months. Uh, rather than any longer period, but it's still worth considering if, you, if you're having a, uh, a holistic approach to eco retrofits. Probably most critical, how, how easy is it to work with? Is it easy to cut? Is it going to work in a retrofit scenario? Can you get continuity of that insulation in the way that you need for performance? How vulnerable is it to being, once it's been installed, in terms of uh, tenant use, residence, even during the works itself, storage on site. All of these things come into play when, it, uh, when you're considering what insulations to use. When we talk about vapour permeability, we're talking about products that will allow water vapour to pass through them, but not necessarily air, and molecules being different sizes. And the moisture, much like heat, will try to find equilibrium within its surroundings, so it's always trying to move through through uh, constructions or around uh, barriers to that. Um, so a vapour balance construction is one that allows that moisture to migrate through it and a vapour sealed one will prevent that moisture from moving and therefore you need to do something to extract that moisture from within the living environment. <coughs> I'd like to use these next two slides. I wrote a guide uh, which you can download um, from the Institute for Sustainability website on building fabric and um, I just thought it was important to ram home that insulation is not magic. What it does is trap air or in some cases a gas, small pockets of that air and that provides the insulation. If you leave big gaps in the insulation you will not, may as well have not bothered putting it there in the first place. It's all about having that continuity of trapped pockets of air around your building. There are a few that work differently. VIPS, for example, keeps uh, a, va a continuous vacuum around the outside of your building uh, for obvious, obvious reasons. But the reasons for failure in insulation is invariably because it's thermal bypass, so there are gaps in the insulation and the warm air is simply bypassing the insulation because of thermal bridging. And Thermal bridging is something you're probably going to have to accept in the majority of retrofits. You're never going to be able to eliminate it entirely, but at least you can account for it. It might be wind washing where, where we, uh, air is passing over the surface and drawing those uh, warmer pockets of air out of that product. Or it might be gas leakage over time if that's a pe petrochemical. Those are the reasons for failures of insulation. Um, that, that you can't quite see it on here, but that's, that's polyurethane insulation, which is showing how you can just about see very, very tiny pockets of air. That's why the performance you get from that product is so high, is because the density of the little pockets is very high. Aerogels <coughs> utilize a product um, with, called Nanogel within their blanket makeup, and it's 95% air and 5% stuff, uh, and that's why it gets such good performance. So what, when that stuff doesn't work is when you just think it is magic and you just stick it in willy-nilly, hoping that it's going to do its job. I happened to be walking that past this building in London just before they covered it up. This was a rain screen cladding on a Briam excellent energy-efficient office refurbishment. Um, 
and this was, this was just one of many panels I found like this, uh, and it kind of makes you want to weep, really. <coughs> so, in the course we go into great detail about the various applications of insulation. Um, starting really with external is always your first port of call, if you can. The reasons why you wouldn't are because of a number of constraints that come with sticking insulation on the outside of your building. Uh, and as an architect, one of the first things we come up against in all of those scenarios is uh, the planning status of that particular building. Permitted development has helped to some extent because external insulation is now classed as an improvement, but there are still some constraints on your use under PD because it talks about materials matching uh, the existing. So if you've got a brick building or a building with architectural features or it's in a listed or a conservation area, planning is still going to be a significant constraint on your ability to do external wall insulation. Although it's interesting that the NPPF talks about where developments will lead to less than substantial harm to the significance of that property, it has to be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal. So that might be weighing up how much impact is there on the heritage value of this property <coughs> versus the lifespan and the health and the usefulness uh, of that, for example, social housing use inside the building. Interesting to test that, I think, in a few cases. But even so, even you know, planning issues aside, there are times when it's probably not appropriate to overclad your buildings in insulation. If you have a nice uh, stone terrace, like this one here in my hometown in Cornwall, um, you know, as an architect, I, I would feel uh, you know, that's, that's a good argument for not overcladding that building. And we can't, we can't kind of throw away the value of our architectural heritage um, when there are other ways of dealing um, with energy efficiency. And a lot of private owners that we've been engaged with will find that they're very reluctant to do external wall insulation if they think that a part of the property, part of the value in their property is in those architectural features. And if you're in a street of a certain typology and uh, that value is lost, um, then people are going to be very resistant to um, overcladding. <coughs> you may find that there are very difficult boundaries. This was a real scenario I came across where we were looking to do external wall insulation. That's the main access route for a number of properties into the rear garden. It's already very tight. It made even more tight by the need to open meter boxes. To try and insulate that externally would have been fairly impossible. You might be asked to do one half of a pair, which we, which we were in this case, down here. Um, and, and that makes life difficult, but it, but it can be done. <coughs> Another important constraint to consider, and this particularly comes into its own on post-war properties, is ca can the fabric itself support the insulation? Qu quite often we find that we're involved in retrofitting these type of buildings because um, uh, you know, these are solid concrete or very little insulation and the residents just can't afford to heat those spaces. So external insulation is seen as a very welcome thing. But what may look very solid in terms of concrete can often be fragile in terms of unreinforced thin layers of concrete on the outside. So you need to be very mindful of what you're pinning insulation into. Um, in this case, this is a tower block that looked like very sturdy brick cladding on the outside turned out to be very poorly installed, very loosely tied brickwork on a 20-storey block. And you can see the cracks here, what happened when one windy evening that whole panel was sucked off the end of the building, fell 20 storeys. Fortunately, four in the morning, no, no one was around. Um, but all of that had to come off and be replaced with insulation. And you may find that its exposure to, to the weather means that it's already degrading rapidly. And actually, insulation quite often is part of the solution to repair of the building. If you can protect that fabric within a, a warm, dry environment, the extent of concrete repairs that you need is reduced significantly. So why do we want to do external in preferal, preference to internal? Mainly because it's, I think it's just more cost effective in terms of, cost effective in terms of U-values. You, you have a, a broader range of materials that you can use. 
It protects the walls from that weathering, so uh, that prolongs the life of the building. It reduces the condensation risk because you've got your cold surfaces are all on the... Um, there, are, there are no cold surfaces created in, in the uh, wall build-up. You've retained the thermal mass like you have in this instance on the inside of your building where it's useful to you. And because you can wrap around most elements, you can have le there will be less thermal bridging in your retrofitted scheme. It's more practical if you've got residents who are going to remain occupied in that property. It's almost impossible to do it internally whilst they live in a property. You have no loss of floor space. You can do a whole street in one go. It makes it much more effective, or a tower block in one go. And if you're having to replace the windows, there are things you can do to better integrate the windows into the insulation at the same time and make life easier. So lots of good advantages. But why would you not do it? Well, because of that planning risk that we've talked about. You know, these properties here. Th this, is a, this property here was retrofitted to 60%. Uh, reduction in carbon, but you are never going to be able to do that by retrofitting on the outside. Um, you can begin to kind of do replica work and recreate a lot of features. As an architect, the, I think there's a kind of limit to how far you can push the credibility of that. It might be fine for certain buildings. For something, you know, uh, uh, much older, you, you begin to question the, um, you just be kind of the heritage value of that. The other thing you find with external wall insulation is there's a lot of stuff on the outside of buildings. Downpipes, drainage, tiling, garages, satellite dishes, alarms, uh, you know, burglar alarms, canopies, lights, even plant, plants on the outside of building or often used as excuses why you don't do external wall insulation. And of course nothing lines up anymore. Your eaves doesn't line up with the roof. Uh, your verges don't line up when you put external insulation on, your neighbours, you don't line up with the neighbours anymore. So you have to do a lot of extra work around those sorts of constraints. So here, for example, this garage had to be taken down entirely to be able to insulate that end wall. Um, here you've got numerous satellite dishes and other constraints stuck on the outside of the building that ha all have to come off. And here you can see, this, there's the line of the original eaves, uh, we've insulated on the outside quite substantially and all that ease has to be moved out to accommodate a new row of tiles up. And it all adds to kind of the cost of retrofit. But I think you know, the end product um, makes a very successful uh, job. Some of the materials you can use, I'm just going to whiz through these really. Natural materials, thinking about those categories we talked about earlier, you've got wood fibres, cork, cellulose in timber cassettes, which I'll come on to later. All of those have a kind of lambda value around 0.04, which is uh, a fairly, fairly good uh, performance. And they're kind of glued or pinned to the wall, as you can see in here. And they come in different thicknesses, so you can deal with edges and reveals. And a lot of these are capable of being cut on site. They're tongued and grooved, so they can be locked together and achieve really good continuity of that insulation. Uh, stone wool and rock wool, um, glass wool type products you can see here offer a slight improvement in terms of lambda value, um, similar uh, characteristics in terms of how you fit them onto the building, glued, pinned. Um, stone wool itself offers some acoustic and fire protection properties which particularly comes into its own in high rise scenarios. Uh, you almost, there's almost nothing else you can use to uh, line around windows and around compartment floors um, and it gets to the point where you think well I may as well just do it everywhere because uh, otherwise I've got to keep changing materials and that's prone to um, weaknesses. It's also vapour permeable so that can give you some benefits um, where you've got older properties that might be continuing to dry out after years of being exposed to weather. When we look into the um, petrochemical fossil fuel based products. The obvious one that's used is expanded polystyrene. Here this is a, a re retrofit of a, a rear extension. This was a hybrid scheme so the front of the property was part of a heritage streetscape but the rear extensions were less sensitive so EPS was used on the rear. In this case this project was aiming for close to passive house standards so we've got something like 280 mil thick of EPS on there. 
And what's worth noting on here is that all of these joints are very well plastered and sealed. There are no air gaps around any of that material as it's built up. There's a variant on EPS called extruded polystyrene, which is a closed cell equivalent, and that's used typically below ground, um, below your DPC level, um, or it literally in floors itself um, because it can, be, it can keep the moisture out, um, and that's uh, almost... Um, I'm not sure of what other products there are. It's one that I would refer to generally for below ground areas. The most common probably EPS product on the, on the market now though is, is a, a more enhanced variant that has impregnated with, with graphite which improves that lambda value quite substantially so you're getting really good thermal performance out of that uh, and it's broadly the same um, characteristics as, as normal EPS um, just to get that higher performance. Here you can see uh, this is the first Enerfit retrofit on a property in the UK and you can see how one of the advantages of EPS is how it can be carved and sculpted to fit exactly your particular circumstances in a way that many other products can't be. John, this is your house, isn't it? So uh, John's probably well placed to, to talk about phenolics. These uh, achieve really high performance in, in, in very slim thickness, which is presumably why John's uh, used it here. Um, there, there are a few words of caution to this. You do need to make sure that phenolics are, are well cured. There have been some samples of uh, kind of too fresh phenolic being put onto buildings and it's, it's begun to, or it's continued to shrink slightly, which has had to be go back and, and retrofitted. So you need to make sure that your materials that you're using are aged correctly but again that gives you the much higher performance in um, a much thinner thickness which may be really important if you uh, aren't able to adapt eaves or verges in the way that you saw earlier and finally at the kind of super performance end you, you can do stuff with vacuum insulated panels I see there's some uh, guys here today um, demonstrating it in it use in, it in a floor situation. This is a project where we've used it as part of the TSB uh, funded retrofit for the future projects to work out how to integrate it into external wall situations. It comes in standard panels, so really you have to kind of maximise the amount of standard panel you can use, fill the gaps with, in this case, phenolic battens. That gives you somewhere to kind of pin it to the wall as well because you can't puncture the vacuum insulated panel. And then we used an outer layer of, of phenolics to protect that. And the reason why you'd be doing that is because of that kind of exceptional performance up there in terms of its thermal conductivity. <coughs> so having kind of made your selection on external wall material, you've got to think about how you finish that product. And the most common one will be a, an external insulated render finish. So these would typically be a synthetic render, a thylic, acrylic thin coat uh, or a silicon thin coat material that is applied to the outside of your insulation in two layers, typically a base coat, probably around six millimetres, and that gets reinforced with uh, nylon meshes, particularly around corners, as you can see beginning to happen here, around corners and around windows, that all gets reinforced uh, before it's uh, troweled on. Um, uh, and, a, and a base coat to give you the evenness and uh, robustness that you need to, for impact damage. Uh, and then a top coat will go onto that, which is a, uh, a two mil through coloured finish. <coughs> and various manufacturers will uh, sing about the benefits of their particular product. Um, my general advice is if you can find something that is good at repelling water, then that's great because it will repel dirt as well. And be mindful of using the really dark colours because they will leach out or in fact they absorb quite a lot of heat and become more prone to damage or cracking as, uh, as you know, summers, when we, where, if and when we do have hot summers. Um, so I tend to favour lighter colours over the darker ones in that circumstance. Next kind of step up from a basic render finish is where you perhaps need to match in for planning reasons with um, a brick finish. 
don't want to go to the full extent of a, of a true brick material. Um, this was the circumstances on this project here where we weren't within a conservation area but we were across the road from a conservation area and the planning officers insisted that we use a synthetic brick effect render. And that literally means a kind of double layer of render going on, the sub layer being the mortar colour and the top layer being the brick colour and the operatives literally score the brick patterning out of the building, out of the outer layer to give you the brick effect. <laughs> how effective that is, it can, how convincing that is, I will leave to your own opinion. Um, it, I've only done it where the planners were insisting on it and uh, cost constraints meant it was the only option available to us. I think one of the problems with that is, is finding the people who've got the time and the attention and the skills to do it really effectively because it is a kind of handcrafted finish. Um, and it can be done fairly well and from a distance it looks pretty convincing. Stepping up from that you can get actual um, brick look-alike templates that are kind of pre-formed that can be stuck on the outside of the building. Uh, and going one cost step further you can get actual brick slips now sort of 20 mil thick real bricks that are bonded onto the insulation um, and are pointed up in the same way as brick and that will give you the most authentic looking brick um, finish in an external wall insulation scenario. Outside of those you then get into the realm of rain screen cladding and that requires separate carrier systems and a ventilated void behind it and the expense begins to go up and the performance can often go down because of the bridging effect of the aluminium or the timber that's doing the carrying of that aspect of the finish. And typically that finish is going to be a rendered cement particle board, as in this case here, um, or a laminate board, proprietary laminate board, as was used in this tower block, or in this case, this was a, the, the client wanted a kind of fairly high-end finish, so we've got an aluminium um, rain screen panel in this case here, um, carried on, on, a, on a rain screen. You can just about see the fins there that carry that system up the tower block. But the problem I find is that that, that aluminium, you get a great finish, um, it looks great and it weathers really well. The problem is, is that thermal performance drop. In this case, for the same thickness of insulation as an uh, a re external rendered situation, the drop in performance was 0.1 of a U value, which is you know, if you're going from 0.25 to 0.35, that's quite a significant drop. <coughs> As with anything, it's the interface details that are important. Under a standard kind of, uh, a kind of eco-sponsored retrofit, you'll find that they always stop at the DPC. They never deal with all the tricky parts. They never really deal with the reels. They might do if it's easy, um, but it's, this is where the performance makes a big difference, I think. The, the thermal imaging here, these, these are therm models showing the relative um, uh, intensity of heat loss through those two scenarios. So on the right, we've got um, an eco, or this, this was um, uh, the scheme before that, I forgot what it's called now, but the, the kind of, no, it was the um, CESP. CESP. So that's a CESP scheme, stopped at DPC. So the combined impact of an aluminium carrier rail at that point and no insulation below there means that below ground that white shows you how intensively the heat is passing out through that building. On this case on the left we've insulated down into the ground to the top of the foundations and we've been much more effective at stopping that heat loss in that case. And that can be, have quite a dramatic effect on the whole building um, when it's applied around the whole perimeter. But this is really disruptive. This is what you have to get involved in to do that insulation. It's why people tend not to do it. Um, you know, it's, it, if, if you do it well, you're talking about moving gullies and uh, realigning paving slabs and all of the, inf the, the cost that goes with that. Same at the top. If you put external insulation on, you've then got to deal with the eaves and the verges. And that may mean adding in additional layers of uh, tiles or slate. Um, to give you the same effect, uh, same finish as before, same weathering capping. Or if you're particularly ingenious, as um, 
the guys at Pruitt Bisley were in their retrofit for the future, you might devise a capping system that goes on top of the insulation to save you having to do that extra um, line of slates. And in this case, that integrated a guttering into the top of the insulation. One of the other benefits of EWI is that you, if you're replacing windows at the same time, you can position that window to be most effective. Typically that might mean moving the window out into the plane of insulation or allowing the insulation to overlap the window. In this particular case you can see these windows even have the insulation on the outside of the frame ready to receive your external wall insulation so that your heat loss around the edges of that frame are absolutely minimal. That's a similar scenario where we've moved the windows forward of the plane of the original windows. We've uh, taped all around those for our air tightness, ready for a parge coat that's coming later and you can see it there where it's been parged on the outside of the building and then when the insulation is then added and render finish that window uh, becomes part of that new envelope um, and can look, although the frames are quite large here, they're very slim here when they're covered with the insulation. Okay, so that's external. We also need to talk about internal wall insulation because quite often planning consent is going to be a real barrier and with internal wall insulation generally consent is not required. Internal wall insulation is only going to need special permission um, in the scenario of listed buildings <coughs> and it means all of those external architectural features can be retained um, and it means if you've got tight boundaries you can still achieve higher performance. One, one good advantage is that you can get really good continuity with your loft insulation or with your suspended timber floor insulation. When you've got external wall insulation, those two layers of insulation are slightly um, isolated by the structure itself. One advantage of internal is that that can be really well integrated um, with each other and the interfaces can be dealt with very effectively. You can also do this more effectively room by room. So if you're on a kind of budget stream, you can choose to do one room at a time, um, particularly if there's a one trigger for doing that room, say you're replacing a your kitchen, you can retrofit internally that area alone um, and then do others as, you, as and when funding or opportunity becomes available. The downside of course is that it's just the most disruptive part of all. Very difficult to live in a space whilst it's being retrofitted with internal wall insulation. So it's probably going to require a decant and it's certainly going to require extensive redecoration. It's going to mean a loss of floor space. I did a lot of work with the um, uh, Energy Saving Trust where we interviewed residents who were being lined up for the solid wall insulation field trials and one of the questions I asked them was how much insulation would you be prepared to accept on the inside of your walls? 50 millimetres, 100 millimetres, 150 millimetres or more. And if you had to, had to draw a curve through their responses, by far and away the highest response would have been 100 millimetres, which is quite interesting. You know, it wasn't, they didn't go for the minimum. Uh, most people thought that 150 millimetres was too much, but most people were comfortable with around 100 millimetres. And that's pretty good because you can get a fairly substantial improvement out of 100 millimetres of insulation. The big problem, of course, is interstitial condensation risk. The danger is that that warm, moist air inside your building condenses on the now cold inside surface of your solid wall. Um, and that that's going to cause mould growth problems in at this suspended floor, intermediate floor interface. It could lead to rot in those joist ends, which then becomes a structural issue. So it's very important to have uh, your strategy for dealing with that, whether that's extraction or, or a vapour permeable construction. If you've now sealed the warmth off from that solid wall, it's possibly not drying out in the way that it used to. Uh, so if you're in a particularly area, an area that's particularly prone to um, uh, wet weather, consistent wet weather, maybe you need to be very careful about how you administer that insulation and the, the standard that you go to um, because if that wall is not being dried out by escaping heat that means that over seasons that moisture level in that in that's going to continue to build up to the point where it's just permanently damp on that internal interface 
one other reason for not doing EWI, IWI might be you just the room is too small. But if, you're, if you push your architect, there might be ways to get around that by reorganizing, rethinking the spaces within that room. Here, for example, that toilet uh, was a separate space before. Clearly, um, quite difficult to retrofit around that on two sides. But by opening the space up, we were able to uh, justify the internal solution in this case. Uh, there's the joist end problem. If, in, you know, if anyone's got a definitive answer on how to deal with joist ends in internal wall insulation scenarios, then we're all very interested to hear. You'll, you'll find a whole range of opinions between doing nothing and allowing a small amount of heat to escape in that area so that the wall stays drier and the joist ends stay drier, through to being particularly meticulous about how you achieve air tightness around each individual joist um, to the extreme measure which is cut the joist ends off put in a new steel beam and deal with it and take the problem away entirely <coughs> but that's what we're fighting against you know mold growth this is where some uh, standard internal wall laminate plasterboard was removed to find problems beginning to be built up and the long-term effect of that you know is on on inhabitants health particularly in areas where they're now living in a more sealed environment. Other constraints, this was a, a retrofit project that we encountered that in a house that had been left unoccupied for a while. Um, again, it's like the outside. We have a lot more stuff on the inside of our buildings to deal with. Wardrobes, shelves, carpets, curtains, skirtings, radiator pipe work, radiators in, in bay windows that are perfectly shaped to that bay window which then won't fit when you've internally lined it. Electrical installations, telecommunications systems wired around walls, all of that effectively is going to have to be moved before you can do internal wall insulation. And again you've got that same range of options with product wise. Here we've got mineral walls or natural walls being used in uh, stud situations. Uh, in this case, it was timber studs. Some manufacturers produce phenolic foam studs with a, um, like an OSB or a, or a plywood uh, finish on the inside to give you a, a fixing surface for the plasterboard um, so that there's no cold bridging of the stud itself. Um, this is a kind of typical, um, you, you know, your jobbing builder's solution um, where they, they use a, a thermal laminate board uh, plasterboard bonded to a, a fossil fuel insulation to give you high performance. Maybe you'll get this, um, sorry, maybe you'll get this uh, kind of system of, of metal stud offset from the wall to improve the performance even further. My word of caution on all of that is, is the, in this case, the moisture barrier is this thin bit of foil behind that plasterboard. And that's probably working really effectively in the middle of that plasterboard, but again, it's the joints. What happens when those are butt jointed together? How do you effectively deal with that margin um, and stop moisture from moving from the warm surface through to the colder surfaces on the inside? Because it only takes a millimetre slot in a metre, a metre long, millimetre wide slot to generate a pint of water through a building over the course of a day. Other products, uh, again, because of that kind of constraint on thickness, you may find yourself airing towards the higher performance boards. Um, and an alternative to that laminate board solution will be to use a foil-faced board uh, as a separate, to keep, it, keep the finish layer and your air tightness layer separate. So that in this case, that board can be very effectively fitted between those existing joists. It can be sealed around with foam to ensure thermal continuity and this is kind of mid retrofit here you can see you can then tape all of those joints and tape around the edges and you can see and test that you've got good effective air barriers in that scenario and then come along afterwards once you've achieved that taping um, to put your battens on run your wiring around and then put your plasterboard on and that's arguably a better way a more robust way of dealing with um, thin foil vapour barriers in that scenario. <laughs>
But the alternative is to have a vapour diffuse material that will allow um, moisture to breathe within the building. Sorry, I'm not allowed to use the word breathe. To permeate through the fabric. Um, this particular one uh, is a, a, a we saw this right at the beginning of today where, when I was demonstrating this to the former science minister. Um, this is a, a wood fibre board that is impregnated with mineral layers to inhibit the progress of moisture through the board because this board itself is quite capable of absorbing a lot of that moisture, holding on to it until circumstances change and then re-releasing the moisture back into the space and dealing with it in a, a different way to um, a, a vapour, a, a non-vapour diffuse uh, product. In this case, the air tightness barrier was on the warm side, on the cold side of this insulation because it's a lime parge coat that went on on the other side of the insulation. And you can only do that because this insulation is helping you modulate the, the moisture levels. There it is going on the wall. You can see lots of other little air tightness details going on around various interventions. And this is a great simple thing. This is the first time these guys have done it, but it's, it's sort of so easy, tongued and grooved. It's, you know, even I could do it. It's fairly foolproof. So we need to think about air tightness in conjunction with that internal wall insulation. And that might be inherent in the product itself, or it might need to be a separate layer. Here you can see on, these are some of our detailed drawings where you know, we've really tried to highlight exactly where that air tightness barrier is and which component is providing the air tightness in this case. Um, and there are lots of good products available on the market, tapes and grommets that have been accelerated, tested to, to demonstrate 50 years of, of life. Um, they cost a bit more, but they will be really effective in giving you air tightness. Uh, and I think that's been proven out in a lot of the retrofit for the future projects where they've all achieved really good air tightness in retrofitted buildings. Um, sometimes you need to be mindful of that moisture can move both ways. So there are, there are examples of moisture being driven inwards in summer circumstances. So you might want to consider, in this case, a vapour diffuse air barrier. So this allows moisture to pass through the membrane but stops air itself from escaping from the building. The thing I want to talk about in bringing external and internal wall insulation together is that it's almost inevitable in a lot, a lot of properties there are going to be compromise areas, there are going to be thermal bridges that you can never totally eliminate. So a few examples on here like where you're having to retrofit internally because of a streetscape, you've got the party wall junction that can't be uh, eliminated in its entirety. So you might want to think bringing that insulation back along the wall to lengthen the heat loss path will help deal with that. Quite common scenario is hybrid insulation, external on the rear where it's less architecturally sensitive, internal on the front, but there is always an interface between the two that you might not be able to deal with and that might mean you know, areas of internal wall insulation to deal with those thermal bridges. Here you've got very narrow hallways, walls either side, there's almost no room to put any insulation on. And I think you know, you're just going to have to accept that those do what you can in certain circumstances, incorporate it into your energy modelling, um, and just be mindful of your ventilation and moisture strategy in those particular scenarios. Always an important consideration in conjunction with any external or internal wall insulation is what you do with the windows. And it's, I always try to remind people that when we think about windows, we're thinking about how we can improve the frame and the um, glazing U values in themselves. That's obviously important. They're a significant area of heat loss. They also contribute to the air leakage of the building. You know, very often the first complaint that people have in old buildings is, is, is drafty windows. So they're an important um, element to address there. Um, typically a weak spot is around the edges of windows and you know, with these old kind of critical metal windows that I find in a lot of post-war stuff that I deal with, they will almost certainly be the highest heat loss area within that, the highest heat loss surface within that room. So dealing with those uh, is important. But you have to be mindful that the windows need to support your ventilation strategy. Whether that's simply having the window as an opening light for purge ventilation, whether it's about integrating trickle vents within that um, frame itself, it just have to be windows will inevitably form an important part. And that might also include 
a summer overheating scenario where you want cooler air to be coming through your building overnight. And so security might be part of your window consideration. There's a few scenarios from one of the guides that I wrote. Particularly sensitive areas, listed building scenarios. We're talking about adding secondary glazing. Sometimes you can get double, secondary double glazing onto the inside. That's probably your least um, intrusive architectural measure. Um, you might be able to simply replace the windows themselves. And now there are good examples around of really high performance windows. I think there's some here on display here where you know, they have insulation integrated within the frame, triple glazing. Um, even the spaces between the panes of glass are now insulated to give you exceptional performance. But if you can try to integrate it within an external or internal wall insulation strategy, you then want to think about the type of window and the, the way you position that window within that. So with a high performance window, it might be an inward opening window, particularly if it's coming from the continent where that's more common. That gives you a good opportunity to overlap the insulation over the frame. But in an internal scenario and an inward opening window, that might give you some problems because you end up with a much thicker frame exposed on the outside in order to give you that thermal bridging overlap. Uh, so, yeah, just a picture of summing up some of that. There's, there's a reveal board taken back along a party wall to try and deal with the heat losses there. Uh, and there's, there's a kind of knock-on effect, if you like, of internal wall insulation and inward opening windows because those frames got, get substantially thicker to accommodate the reveal insulation. So maybe in that situation it would have been better to go with an outward opening window that would have had a better external appearance and worked better with inward opening. How are we doing for time? Mm, probably gone over. I'll try and do the rest of it in about 10 minutes. Floors, I think, are the most tricky bit. They're the most disruptive. Um, and it's the one that gets left out of most strategies. I remember when early days of being involved in Green Deal, you know, it wasn't even being discussed at all. Everyone was talking about loft insulation, cavity insulation, EWI, IWI. Floor insulation just wasn't even being discussed, which seemed bizarre to me because it's a big heat loss area. It's a big area of um, air infiltration within the building. And we don't really have fantastic products that just magically deal with it. It's a tricky, tricky area to deal with. Um, suspended floors are very common. Um, significant source of air infiltration, a significant source of just cold surface within the room. My wife always moans about our suspended timber floor, sitting there, feet are cold, what are we going to do about it? Well, we have to insulate it. And we have to do that either by uh, fitting perhaps solid insulation between the joists. Um, good practice there might be to undercut those and, and fill with foam to seal them in effectively. Or perhaps we're talking about dropping a net or a membrane over and around those floor joists so that we can fill it with a loose material or put uh, mineral wool bats squashed in between those joists. Now that's clearly quite a disruptive process uh, and another constraint of that is if we have a ventilated void underneath we really should be trying to maintain the ventilation in that void um, to make sure our timbers are nice and dry. So that's bound to be disruptive, which is why it never gets, it always gets done latest. But that's how a good, effective mineral wall type insulation would be installed. Um, and you can see there, you know, the, the, these floorboards were individually numbered so they could be lifted and then dropped back in. Quick question. Stone wall. Filling the whole floor void. Okay. Be interested to see examples of that. Come see me afterwards. Um, there's an example of that, of that using a higher performance board, uh, again, fitted down between the floor joists. Um, um, but of course, in reality, floor joists are never nicely even spaced like the insulation bats that come off a production line are. So there's a lot of cutting and trimming of, of those sorts of products to do. And if you've got things like pipe work in that floor void, um, you know, you've got to cut those boards around all of those 
elements and it creates opportunities for air to get around the insulation and cause thermal bypass. You can also use natural materials. Here's a, here's a solution we did with wood. So that was wood between, or cellulose between the joists on a, on a membrane and wood fibre over the top. And you can see how that integrated really nicely with the internal wood insulation. Um, I haven't got time to go into that. That was about ventilating chimney spaces and what to do with those. Come to the main masterclass to talk about that. Um, here there's a membrane fitted in and around those floor joists. Quite tricky, but everyone I've worked with says it's really tricky you want to do the first bit, but then once I've learnt the knack, it's pretty straightforward. Filled with, insul with cellulose in this case, and then uh, apply structural deck, another layer of wood fibre to give you that continuity. But of course that's going to have a knock-on effect on all of your doors, stairs, entrance thresholds, all of that, so bear that in mind. <coughs> Um, this was a solid floor insulation, so there's not much you can do about that other than digging up the whole floor and starting again. In this case, to keep the thickness to a minimum, we used an aerogel board that was bonded to a chipboard flooring. And you can see how that was laid and taped in, in situ there with a the minimal of impact on, on the um, uh, minimal impact on the existing um, things like doors and steps and door and um, stairs but you're kind of limited in its, in its performance in that scenario. And that was insulating floors. Um, lofts, I don't have to go into too much because it's a much more common area, but that's a typical loft, not a nice, you know, clean, empty space. That's more typical of what you'll find. And it's really about, uh, people will tell you, oh yeah, that loft's been insulated. But you, you know from looking at that, that, you know, there are big gaps in this. That's not a well insulated loft. It's having almost no effect whatsoever. And what we really want is something like that, where we've got a nice, tidy space, insulation well fitted between the ceiling joists and insulation over the top, ventilated at the eaves, ventilated preferably at the ridge. In this case, they did it at the halfway up the roof space as well. <coughs> um, but good continuity of that insulation everywhere. And that was kind of easy to do in a, uh, an open roof scenario. If you had a trussed rafter, you might want to think about maybe blowing insulation into that space. Um, this, was a, this was a stone wall insulation that was blown into a loft that had a lot of purlins and various bits and pieces. You need to think about the kit that goes with it, loft access. Um, it's very difficult to find a really, really airtight loft, uh, loft hatch, um, at least if you can get a good one and one that uh, the, the steps and everything are well integrated, you've got a good fighting chance. Or you might be able to make something up yourself and get a much more effective product. Um, where I've come across it in heritage properties with lime ceilings, we had to eliminate those altogether because of a fire risk. Then we had an opportunity to line that ceiling with OSB, fill the loft up, and this can now carry the weight of a much more filled loft. And then um, we've got continuity of our air barrier with our external internal parge coat there um, and again it's the same principle as I was talking about with walls where we could now have a surface that we can add our wiring to and our light fittings and a plasterboard finish goes over the top of that to give us the finish we want. We might have to mix products where we've got tricky situations, constraints like in a shoulder here we've got a thin area so we might have different products to deal with different scenarios. But it also kind of depends on your roof finish. Am I taking the roof off or am I keeping it? Can I insulate on the inside of those rafters as well as between? Can I insulate over the top of those rafters as well as between? Um, so thinking about how that might work, there's obviously the former um, and there's, there's how the latter might work, and which is much better if you want to think about insulating it and integrating with your external wall insulation. It's all thinking about it in the round. This is Sturley Farm up in north of Huddersfield where they did exactly that. Here, new roof going over the top of the existing roof. New, new um, joists gone up which are then filled with mineral wool and a wood fibre board right over the top of everything to give you that thermal continuity. You can see the wool packed in between there. Inside OSB and lots of taping around all of those existing roof trusses and the reason they were doing that was to get that sort of finish on the inside and that you know that's kind of worth keeping and worth spending a, a certain amount of time over in my opinion. And then finally flat roofs it's kind of 
Generally, you're talking about load-bearing, rigid insulations packed onto the top. The key one I want to talk about there is just how you integrate, again, external wall insulation and flat roof insulation. How do you deal with that overlap? Because this, this is like foam cantilevering over space, effectively. Uh, and if you want to get a fascia onto that, that someone's, at, you know, at some point is going to put a ladder up against or someone's going to stand on that edge, really you need to think about how you can perhaps deal with that with outriggers in timber first, insulate in and between um, so that that's dealt with structurally and then you can insulate up to the underside of those and get an effective fascia and edge to that building. Okay, I'm going to finish up now with uh, a case study that does it a little bit differently and it's one that's on site at the moment so I'm just going to show you through pictures of it. But this is the Thamesmead estate in South East London um, one of my particular areas of interest is this kind of post-war stuff that's... Um, my argument is that in heritage buildings, because of all those constraints, there's, only a, there's a limit to how far we can go in terms of carbon reduction without, you know, damaging the property. So it's careful to, you know, we need to be mindful of that and the Sustainable Traditional Buildings Alliance are doing really good work in understanding exactly what we should be doing in those properties. And I think that's great and we need to do that and preserve our cultural assets, but the corollary, corollary, the corollary of that, the other side of that, uh, is that we've got all of this post-war stuff that's typically probably not very loved um, architecturally, probably has quite good space standards inside, and, um, and will encompass a community that have quite often been there since the beginning and actually really like living in their high-rise or in their estate, they just don't like the environment outside of their building. But we can do something about that, and I think we should expect to go much further on these properties where we can to allow us to be sensitive on older heritage properties. So in this scenario, um, this building, we're taking all of those retrofit components and doing it in a factory where we know we can get really good performance from doors, windows, cladding, insulation, everything built off-site, prefabricated in timber and cellulose and then craned into place and you can see on here fixed on the outside of that building. This is all being done with residents still in situ with their windows still in place um, and we are wrapping all the vertical surfaces in, and with very little disruption to residents we've got almost a brand new building on the outside to Passive House standard. These are garages down underneath being converted into shop units and community use, so there's lots of other things to think about retrofit beyond just the, the dwellings themselves. Um, but I think this idea of prefabricated assembly of retrofit is a really interesting one and one that I hope we're, we can... This, this is the first one that I know of in the UK and we're hoping that we can do more in the future. Uh, there's the south rear of the property you know, quite a dramatic change from what you can see over here on those, those buildings to a, a, a really contemporary look on these schemes. I'm not going to go into this too much because I've run out of time really, but just to say overheating is a risk. It can be dealt with with effective solar control, utilising thermal mass, good ventilation at night time, and a couple of tricks you can retrofit as well balconies, external louvers, shutters, even planting on the outside, all of those things can help deal with overheating risks in retrofits of buildings. That's it. Normally we do that in six hours over a day <laughs> in a lot more detail, but um, hopefully that gives you a flavour.